Hi everyone, my name is Leanne and today I'm going to be telling you my top 10 books that I read in 2021, better late than never. This year I struggled more than any other year to compile my top 10 list and I think there's a few factors in that you know I've mentioned many times that I wasn't reading as much in the second half of the year but also my reading year feels so split up like the first half of the year when I was living in Ireland feels so separate like my entire life feels so separate which encompasses my reading life, it feels so separate the first half of the year and the second half of the year so it was really difficult to think about the year as a whole package. So much of what I base a five star read on is just like vibes, like I don't particularly have a strict criteria when it comes to reviewing things thoughtfully or critically. When it comes to the distinction between a four star book and a five star book, so much of it for me is based on the feeling that I have when I read it. And I think in terms of those five star feelings, I could definitely remember those feelings more with the books that I read in the first half of the year because I think my reading life was a bigger focus for me in that first six months of the year because my reading life was probably the biggest aspect of my life. Whereas in the second half of 2021, I just had lots of other stuff going on and I think overall my life was you know more enriched because of that but reading did take more of a back seat than it did in the first half of the year. In saying that with the 10 books that I'm going to talk about today there is a 50-50 split between books I read in the first six months and the second six months of the year although some of the books that I read in the second half of the year haven't been tested in the same way as the books that I read earlier on in the year have been in terms of whether the book stayed with me whether it's something I'm still thinking about a long time afterwards. I also have a 50-50 split between books that are intended for younger readers, so children's books and YA books, and books that are intended for grown-up readers, and that is including fiction and non-fiction. I'm not going to be doing it like last year where I did a top 10 list for non-fiction, for children's and YA books, and for adult fiction as well. Honestly there's just not enough books to kind of make that list this year, but I am going to split the books into categories as I talk about them. So I'm going to start with the YA books, then I'm going to talk about the adult fiction books, then I'll talk about the children's books, and then I will talk about the non-fiction. So the first book to make my best books of 2021 list was Honey and Issues Guide to Fake Dating by Adiba Jagadar. Now I could easily put this author on a favourites list. I think if we had to pick out, you know, an author favourite of the year, then it would certainly be Adiba and her debut novel The Henna Wars was something that I read in 2021 as well and that could have easily made this list too but I think Honey and Issues Guide to Fake Dating just takes the top spot for me when it comes to the two books I've read from her so far. So this book is about two teenage girls, Hani and Issue, who are both Bengali, they both live in Dublin and they begin fake dating and I don't know about you but one of my absolute favourite romance tropes in books is fake dating. I think it's so much fun. I I just never get tired of it, particularly when it's two characters who are quite different, like Hanny and Issue, who come to realise that they have a lot more in common than they thought they would. And I love seeing how people kind of perform what they perceive a relationship to be like and then seeing that gradually start to blossom into actual feelings which is what happens in this book. So we have Hani who is like really easygoing, really popular, however when she comes out to her friends as bisexual they don't believe her because she's never had a girlfriend and that representation was something that was really important to me and something that I really valued and I think having a book like this when I was a teenager would have made a huge difference to me. Then we have Issue who feels like she has a lot to prove, she feels like she has to live up to a very high bar that her sister set in terms of expectations for achievement and she becomes determined to become head girl because that's something that her sister never managed to do but she's not popular enough to become head girl and that is where her relationship with Hanny comes into play. Hanny feels like if she can date Issue it will prove to everyone that she is bisexual and Issue thinks that hanging out with Hanny and then being in a relationship is going to bolster her popularity and help her become head girl. The depiction of adolescence in this book was something that felt really authentic to me and while the girls do have similarities in terms of their backgrounds there were also a lot of differences in how they experience their culture and while the author doesn't shy away from any prejudice that these girls might face. It isn't the main focus of this book. The main focus of this book is really just a swoony romance that is so cute and so much fun and we know how much I love my Irish queer YA which brings me very nicely onto the next book on this list 
all our hidden gifts by Caroline O'Donoghue and if I had to pick an absolute favourite book of the year it would be this one. If Adiba was the author of 2021 Caroline was definitely the author of 2020 for me and I read her YA debut in 2021 and thought it was fantastic. All Our Hidden Gifts follows teenage protagonist Maeve as her interest in tarot reading begins to blossom. She finds this old tarot deck and begins messing around with it trying to understand the cards and it turns out she has got quite the talent for this. A bunch of people are asking for her to do readings for them at school and one day when Maeve does a tarot reading for her ex-best friend things take quite a dark turn when she disappears the next day and Maeve can't help but feel that she is somehow responsible for this. Alongside her ex-best friend's older sibling who Maeve has a blossoming romance with, we'll get to that in a second, they begin to investigate what exactly has gone on here and find that there is something a lot darker and a lot more witchy going on. We know I love a witchy Irish book, just like how I loved Perfectly Preventable Deaths by Deirdre Sullivan a few years ago. And when that teen witchy Irish book also has LGBTQ plus themes to it, I am so in. <laughs> I thought the romance plot between Maeve and Ro in this book was handled so beautifully but it was also like so swoony and so exciting and I think the way the author handled sexuality and gender in this book was done excellently. It was handled thoughtfully and carefully but it also wasn't presented like it was the biggest thing in the whole world you know. It was just these two young people figuring out how they felt about each other and how they understand themselves. I also just love the sense of humour in Caroline O'Donoghue's books like I have found her writing so funny in all of the books that I've read from her and this is another one where I felt the teenagers were just so authentic. There were so many other things going on in this book as well like it touches on the Irish political and social landscape and the intersection of all of those things and also American influence on religious and political extremism and I'd never really seen that topic tackled in a book before. I do have the second book in the series here The Gifts That Bind Us and I'm so excited to read this really soon. So moving on to the fiction for grown-ups I have The Mismatch by Sarah Jafari. Now I wasn't sure if this should make the list because I read this in December it really hasn't had that significant test in terms of it standing the test of time but you know what if we are making this judgment on vibes which is what I do I had such a fun time with this book. So in this book we are following 21 year old Soraya who has never been kissed and she has a lot of anxieties around that. Unexpectedly she kind of strikes up this chemistry and this romance with Magnus who is your typical rugby lad at her university but there really is just this spark between these two people and throughout their sort of situationship for much of the novel we see both of their personalities in a really nuanced way. Neither character is without fault, they both do things questionably throughout the course of their situationship together. There is some miscommunication in there but only in a way that I think feels authentic to two 21 year olds trying to navigate a situation they've never had to navigate before. We also see a lot of Soraya's family life and how complicated that is, the difficult and strained relationship she has with both of her parents but because we are also looking into the past and seeing how the relationship between her parents developed and their decision to emigrate from Iran to the UK we can really see what happened in order to lead them up to where their relationship is today. Soraya also has a sister that is no longer in her life and as a reader we know this is because she had a pregnancy which her parents didn't approve of but Soraya doesn't know this and it's really interesting for you as the reader to have that information that she doesn't have. I found this book just compulsively readable, I didn't want to put it down, I thought it was so much fun and it was exactly the kind of romance I love, you know there is the swoony exciting romance but there is also a number of contemporary and societal issues that are running in the background and influencing the relationship between these two young people. I was absolutely gripped by this book. The next book I'm going to talk about is a debut literary fiction novel and that is Snowflake by Louise Nealon. In this book we're following 18 year old Debbie as she has quite a culture shock when she goes off to college or university. She has been brought up on quite a rural dairy farm and she is going to study in Trinity College in Dublin and that takes a lot of adjustment for her in terms of finding her feet and her independence but also socialising with new people, meeting new people, making friends, then navigating those relationships, navigating her sexual relationships and much of this novel follows the self-destructive and often dangerous behaviour that she has when she begins to explore her sexuality and it 
looks at that boundary between an healthy exploration of experimentation and when Debbie oversteps that boundary into behaviour that is really damaging for her. And actually much of this book is about how those kinds of damaging behaviours can worsen if they are neglected, if they are not spoken about, if they are not shared with other people. Debbie isn't the only character that this impacts, she also has extremely fraught relationships with her family, her mother and her uncle in particular, who both have their own internal struggles that are just left to fester and aren't dealt with properly. And while there are those tremendously important and difficult and serious topics, this is also a novel about a girl just trying to grow up and how difficult that transition between your adolescence and your adulthood can be, how confusing and scary it can be, how difficult things are when you are beginning to experience these different situations and emotions for the first time. And despite all of that difficulty, this is a book that is really funny. It's a book that has a real sense of humour to it and I was actually reading this book when I was in the midst of binging Gilmore Girls and there are a lot of references to Gilmore Girls, jokes about Gilmore Girls in this book that I really appreciated at the time that I read it and it was one that I totally sped through. I read most of it in just one morning and as with all of the books on this list it's something that I would definitely like to reread even though I am a terrible rereader. I never do it. I always feel like there's just so many more books for me to read that I can't justify rereading which I know is absurd um, but if I ever do decide to actually make some time for rereading this is definitely one that I would consider revisiting and would want to revisit. So next up I'm going to talk about the Tree children's books. Now full disclosure these three books are all published by the place that I work but I thought they were all bloody brilliant so they're going on the list. The first of those is Me, My Dad and the End of the Rainbow by Benjamin Dean. I am obsessed with this book. <laughs> it was one of the first books I read in a year and just I have wanted to push it into everyone's hands ever since I read it. So this book follows a young boy named Archie who knows that there's something going on with his parents. There is some sort of argument, there's some sort of friction, but he doesn't know what's going on. But his parents do sit down with him and begin to explain what has happened and what has caused this friction in the family. His father has recently come out as gay and is in the process of figuring all of that out. And what I loved about Archie's reaction to this is that there is zero prejudice, there is no judgment, there is no assumption that this changes anything about his father as a person. Archie is confused about whether it changes anything about the dynamics of their family and we do have that miscommunication between Archie and his father as they're just both worried about making sure the other one is okay. The conflict between them doesn't come from a place of prejudice, it comes from a place of them both just trying to figure out what it means for their relationship, whether it does change anything about their relationship and for a while they just don't talk about it. But when a flyer for pride falls out of his dad's pocket, Archie decides that he is going to find out more about this new rainbow community that he finds himself an ally to. So Archie and his friends head off to Pride and have quite the adventure while they are there. It's a book filled with joy and rainbows and celebrations and drag queens. It's such a wonderful happy, just lovely, lovely book and it makes my heart sing that there are books like this out there now. There are books like this for queer children and the children of queer parents, for the friends of queer kids, for the teachers of queer kids, for just anyone and everyone to read. I have Benjamin's second book here, The Secret Sunshine Project, and this is going to be just as joyful. If you loved me and my dad at the end of the rainbow, you're gonna love this as well. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous book. So next up I have Skandar and the Unicorn Thief by A.F. Stedman. Now it feels a little bit cheeky to include this in this list because this doesn't actually come out until the 28th of April so you do have a little while to wait before you can get your hands on it but trust me it's worth it. I do feel very lucky that I could read this one early but the oh it's so good it's so so good. This is my proof copy of course I will put the actual cover on screen so you can see it and as with all of the books that I've mentioned in this video there will be links down below so you can find out more information if you want to. So in this book we follow 13 year old Skandar Smith who has always wanted to be a unicorn rider and being a unicorn rider is a really specialised position to be chosen for. Not everyone is selected to hatch a unicorn and unicorns in this world aren't the kind of glittery fluffy things we might think of. These unicorns are powerful and ferocious and can be dead when a rider becomes bonded to their unicorn, this is a very intense bond, and your unicorn has different sorts of powers depending on what element you are allied with. So there is air, this one, there's also water, fire and earth, but there is also an additional element that has a lot of mystery and secrecy and danger 
attached to it. It's an element that isn't spoken about, it's an element that is closely associated with evil, and I'll leave you to guess which element Skandar finds himself allied to. But it turns out the circumstances with which he was selected to become a unicorn rider are pretty suspicious, and those two things might be linked. This is action-packed, it's filmic, you can tell that the author knows this world so intimately. You can tell that there is so much depth to this world, so many things that she's going to continue to explore in the later books in the series. There are mysteries, some that we get the answers to in this first book, but some I am still like, give me more books so I can find out what's going on. <laughs> and if you're looking for an epic fantasy series to give to a young person in your life or enjoy for yourself and you don't want to give them a series that is written by a massive turf, um, then I'm Skandar. And the final children's book I'm going to talk about is one that just snuck into this list. It was one of the last books I read in the year, but I read it so quickly and it hit me right in the emotions, and that is The Hunt for the Nightingale by Sarah Ann Jux. And this is also illustrated superbly by Sharon King Chai. You may have heard me talk about this one recently in my December wrap up. As I said, it was one that I read really late on in the year and it just snuck into my favourites, but I knew as I was reading it, it had to be there. In this book, we follow young Jasper, who is a little boy that has a huge passion for nature and particularly birds. He has been waiting all spring for the nightingale to return to the garden so that he can hear the nightingale's song. But this bird is missing. And it's not only this bird that is missing, but his sister is missing too. And Jasper thinks there is some sort of link between these two things. Maybe his sister Rosie has gone somewhere to try and find the nightingale. But we know that Rosie, his older sister who was at university, she's not missing. Rosie has passed away. And this is something that Jasper hasn't come to terms with, he hasn't fully understood, and seeing that is so heartbreaking. Seeing him not being able to understand what's going on, oh my god, it got me right in the feelings. Jasper gathers together all of the kit that he thinks he needs, he puts it in his backpack, and he decides that he is going to go and find this nightingale, because if he can find the nightingale, that means he will find Rosie. And the things that Jasper ends up putting himself through on this journey, oh my god, my feelings, and just across the whole journey, he's helping other people find things that they have lost. It's such an emotional story. It is so beautifully and tenderly told. I think it's completely gorgeous and I would urge you to read a copy. Like literally the whole time I was reading it, I was just like, this is fantastic, Like this is so good. Like this definitely has to be on my top 10 books of the year list because it's, it's so good, it's so good. And finally, I have three nonfiction books that were my favourite books of the year, starting with Happy by Darren Brown. If there was a book that I've read not only this year, but in my entire life that has made me, basically like made me reevaluate how I approach my whole life and reevaluate how I think about things, it's Happy by Darren Brown. I have been a huge fan of Darren Brown for years. I have watched like all of his TV shows. I love the work that he does. I find it so fascinating. And it was brilliant to see how what he's talking about in this book is something that feeds into the work that he does and how he manages to shift people's thought patterns because ultimately he understands what they want. This is a book all about the concept of happiness, the idea of happiness. What does it mean to be happy? How does our definition of happy change throughout history and throughout different cultures? It's a book that looks at how we control our own emotions and the decisions we make about our own feelings. So, you know, if we are angry about something, can we simply decide to not be angry about it? And the book also talks about how if something is outside of your control, there's no need to be stressed about it. And can you make a decision to not be stressed about it. I feel like this is a gross simplification of a lot of the ideas that he's talking about in this book, but it was something that really rewired how I thought about a lot of things. It's a book that left a huge impact on me, and it's something that I still think about all the time when I'm going through an emotional period. Like, really, this book changed how I think about basically everything. I thought it was so excellent. The penultimate book I'm going to talk about is What White People Can Do Next by Emma DeBerry. Don't Touch My Hair by the same author was my favourite non-fiction book of 2020. That book was phenomenally researched, there was so much in there and so much that I learned and the same is definitely true of What White People Can Do Next. This is of course a book that is about race but it's one that I think you have to put a lot into to get a lot out of. Some of the ideas that Emma is talking about in this book are really complex and take a lot of time to, I think, understand. There was definitely a lot of stuff that I had to read multiple times to fully get to grips with what she was trying to get across. Not because she's not good at explaining these things, she's exceptional at explaining them, it's just they are complicated, there are lots of factors in them. Particularly around things like what is 
active allyship as opposed to something that is more performative. She also really closely looks at the links between capitalism and how that affects race and essentially how under capitalism it is exceptionally difficult to have an equal society. And because capitalism is so entrenched in basically everything that we do, it's incredibly difficult to dismantle. It's a very slim book but there is so much in there and it is one that I promise is worth the work that it takes and I think it's important in being a white ally to put that work in. And the final book I'm going to talk about is Maybe I Don't Belong Here by David Harewood. I did have a proof of this one but I've since lent it to my housemate because I thought he would get a lot of value out of it. This is David Harewood's memoir about his upbringing, his adolescence, the early days of his career, the establishment of his career as an actor. I think most of you, if you know who David Harewood is, will probably know him from his acting career. And it does look at his career but more the personal things that were going on in the midst of all that career success. The prejudice he faced because of race, the experiences that he has around masculinity and the intersections of those things, but also how those two aspects of his identity intersect with his experiences of psychosis. And much of this memoir is about those mental health struggles. And David talks really honestly and openly about his experiences of being sectioned, the mental health difficulties he faced, and how all of those different elements of his identity meant that how his psychosis was perceived was different to how a white person, for example, their psychosis might be perceived. I thought it was a really engaging and thoughtful and open memoir. And if this is a topic that you would like to learn more about, I would highly recommend this memoir. I think there are so many important things that David is discussing in this book and I'm very grateful for him for sharing his experience. It definitely developed my understanding of so many different topics. So there we have it. They are my top 10 reads of 2021, as I said better late than never. <laughs> if you've read any of the books that I've mentioned do leave me a comment down below and let me know what you thought of them or let me know what your favourite read of 2021 was. As I said all of the books that I've mentioned will be linked down below in the description if you want to find out more about them. If you don't have anything particular to say in the comments leave me a bird emoji so that I know that you're here. And here's to 2022 where I'm hoping there will be lots more amazing books on the horizon. I hope you guys are doing well and I will speak to you in my next video.